Greetings. My name is Jake Yap. I teach at the Loyola School of Theology, and I have been invited to share some of my personal reflections on the relationship between our Blessed Mother and evangelization. When I was first asked to speak about this, I was personally very intrigued. Indeed, can we see Mary of Nazareth as a model of evangelization? Can we learn from her what it means to be a bearer of good news? Fortunately, I am aided here by the module prepared by Father James Kroger. Father Jim writes, Mary's role is always to be seen as subordinate to and anchored within God's loving plan of salvation for all people. She is always an active recipient of God's action yet a true collaborator. Her entire life, from beginning to glorification, is a constant faith response to God's action. Her life becomes a series of fiats. As recorded in the New Testament, her many yes responses enable God's merciful designs to become reality. That's what Father Jim wrote. Let's now unpack what he has written. It all begins with God, or as, as Bishop Robert Barron would say, it's all about God. The creator of the universe has a marvelous plan for the human race. Salvation and eternal life shared with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sin notwithstanding, from the beginning, God announced the good news to reverse the fall of the human race. We read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first gospel announcement. It foretells a woman and her offspring who would be the downfall of the serpent. Mary, Jesus, and the downfall of the kingdom of sin and evil. Mary was invited to play a crucial role in this great drama of human liberation. She was not forced. Indeed, she was courted. She was wooed by God. The angel Gabriel came like a royal ambassador to ask for the hand, as it were, of the lady. And Mary, young and virginal as she was, some would say as young as 14 or 15, Mary said, yes, this was her fiat, be it done to me according to your word. I find it striking that yes runs in the family, so to speak. God the Father said yes to the human race. He says, I will save, I will forgive, I will not destroy. God the Son said yes. In fact, St. Paul in his letter says that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why we utter the amen through him to the glory of God. That's from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. Another thing from the scriptures, one of David's psalms is put in the lips of Jesus. Lo, I come, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Jesus said yes. With Jesus, it is always yes. And so at the Annunciation, Mary said yes. Notice that the angel Gabriel was an evangelizer. He came bringing good news to Mary. By accepting that message and allowing herself to become the mother of Jesus, Mary, in turn, became a bearer of good news to others. Did she not carry good news, quite literally, 
The good news, which is Jesus himself in her womb, yes, she carried that good news literally in her own body. Mary's yes at the Annunciation was to be the beginning of many yeses. Her whole life was a yes to God, a yes to her son, Jesus. Let me be even clearer. If yes means obedience to God's word, then Mary's whole life was one of continual obedience. St. Luke, in his gospel, records, almost in passing, an incident during the public ministry of Jesus. As Jesus was moving among the crowd of people, a woman suddenly raised her voice and exclaimed, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that you suck. In other words, this woman was saying, Oh, your mother must be so happy to have such a fine son like you. She was complimenting Jesus, and in doing so, she was complimenting the mother of Jesus. That's a wonderful compliment, won't you agree? We would have expected Jesus to agree with her and to even thank her. And yet, the actual words of Jesus, the response of Jesus, might initially puzzle us. They almost seem like a rejection of his mother's maternity. What do we read? Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. It sounds like he is rejecting the compliment. But hold on. That's exactly what we see Mary doing at the Annunciation and throughout her life. I mean, who would know better than that than her son Jesus? She hears the word of God and obeys it. And so it turns out that Jesus is teaching us to appreciate Mary's true greatness. Not only that she is his biological mother, but especially that she is the obedient disciple, the follower of God's word. Yes, Mary's whole life was a series of fiats. Let us retrace our steps so far. What have we seen? At the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel is sent by God with good news. At this point, the angel is the evangelizer. When Mary gives her fiat, she receives quite literally the good news in her body. She receives Jesus, the Word of God, who is now conceived in her womb. She now carries the good news. She is now the evangelizer. What happens next? She hastens to the hill country to her cousin Elizabeth, who is also pregnant. Mary, may you be blessed. Let me digress a bit here. By God's grace, I have had three opportunities so far to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Every trip begins in Nazareth at the Basilica of the Annunciation. In the Grotto Chapel, at the lower floor of the beautiful church, behind a grill through which one can still see the rough interior of what is believed to be Mary's humble house in Nazareth, one can read the words on a plaque, Verbum caro hic factum est. There is one word added to the familiar words from St. John's prologue. We know the words. The word was made flesh here, right here. Jesus became good news to Mary right there and then. And she received the word of God right there. She received the word of God right here, according to the plaque. Here, where 15-year-old Mary met the angelic being sent by God, right here, God came to earth. Okay, that is in Nazareth. Our pilgrimage then brought us, in a few days, to what is believed to be the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the place of the visitation. It had taken our group several hours 
to drive from Nazareth to Galilee in Galilee to this village in the hill country near Jerusalem. We were taken there by a modern air-conditioned tourist coach driving at about 80 kilometers per hour and it had taken us several hours to get to our destination. How long would it have taken Mary, pregnant, riding on a donkey perhaps, how long would it have taken Mary to get there from Nazareth? At least several days. Father Jim Kroger writes, Note the clear sense of mission in this scene. Mary, prompted by the Spirit, makes a difficult journey into the hill country. She went in haste. She was on a mission of service. She could have rationalized staying at home. After all, she was pregnant and the journey was long. But she went. There is a wonderful statue outside the present-day Church of the Visitation in the Holy Land. It shows two pregnant women standing belly to belly. It is not only the meeting of two women, it is also the meeting of two babies. In a mysterious and wonderful way, John was meeting the one who, as he would say, was mightier than he, the thong of whose sandals he was not worthy to untie, the one who ranks before him because he was before him. And so Mary the evangelizer literally brings the good news into Elizabeth's home. Her arrival brings joy. John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb just as King David before danced before the Ark of the Covenant. And she herself, the handmaid of the Lord, becomes, who turns evangelizer, is now filled with joy. Mary is filled with joy. Mary sings her magnificent Magnificat. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. I think Pope Francis could not have put it any better. He has joined two words which are inseparable, joy and gospel. This is because true joy is found in the good news and the good news always brings joy. In that apostolic exhortation of Pope Francis, he says that the joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Those who accept his offer of salvation are set free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. Allow me to recount and share with you my own personal journey from evangelized to evangelizer. I was fortunate to be born into a Catholic family, although truth to tell, my parents, I guess like most in their generation, my parents weren't the ones who taught me the essentials of the Catholic faith. They enrolled me in a Jesuit school and left it to my teachers to teach me Christian life education, or CLE as we called it. For the first 17 years of my life, I was a Sunday Christian at best. The good news for me was not good enough for the simple reason that it wasn't really preached or announced to me as good news. It was simply a subject in school. Now, it was while I was studying in university, another venerable Jesuit institution, that I was evangelized in the real sense of the word. And it was accomplished not through the fine theology subjects and teachers, but through the witness of a classmate who casually mentioned over lunch one day in the college cafeteria, he said, you know, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you about it. While I listened to this bold young man recount his 
personal relationship with Jesus, I was of two minds. Part of me cringed at this blatant display of devotional fervor. I mean, how uncool can you get? But you know, another part of me was envious because I wished I had what my classmate Ricky had. Well, the second part won through the continuing witness of my friend Ricky, who introduced me to his other friends, all of whom were renewed Catholics. In a few months, I too could say that I had a personal relationship with Christ. What had happened to me? It was as if all that I had learned before, all my Christian life education in elementary school and theology in college, finally crystallized in the clear and real and attractive figure of Jesus Christ, who in St. Paul's words, loved me and gave himself for me. From being simply in my head, Jesus moved into my heart. I was evangelized. I really fell in love with Jesus. He became so real to me. I could pray, and it was no longer simply memorized prayers. It was real. I could talk to him, and I couldn't stop talking about him to my friends. And I had so much more peace. I had more control over my sins and weaknesses. Um, I was full of joy. Uh, it wasn't as if, though, that uh, everything now became trouble-free and so on. But I knew in my heart that something real had happened. I had encountered Jesus. Jesus became real to me. And so I became evangelized. Now I'm being asked by Jesus to be an evangelizer. I'm sharing all this because I want to personally attest to one thing. Evangelization brings joy. The message itself is joy. The one evangelizing is joyful, and the one evangelized becomes joyful. Once more, we see that our Blessed Mother is a great example of this. At the visitation, she brought joy to the household of Zechariah. The unborn baby in Elizabeth's womb leaped for joy. Elizabeth herself was filled with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of joy. And Mary, she sang her immortal words. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. In my mind, I picture Mary singing her Magnificat with her hands raised and her head thrown back in exultant joy. I picture her full of joy. <laughs> My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She is full of joy. I mean, who could not be joyful if Jesus is alive in their heart? The most effective evangelizers are the true disciples, those who have genuinely encountered Jesus and in their joy sold all that they had to follow him. And, and the worst evangelizers, those without joy, those, according to Pope Francis, whose lives seem like Lent without Easter. Can you imagine that? Pope Paul VI, in his landmark encyclical on evangelization in the modern world, observes that modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if he does listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. How true that is, at least to me. I had listened to my renewed Catholic friends back then because they witnessed to me the joy of a transformed life in Christ rooted in a personal relationship with him. I said, I wanted that, and I got it. And now, 40 years later, I'm still doing my best to evangelize others, helping them to appreciate 
the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Mary at the Annunciation and Visitation stories teaches us much about evangelization. It's not, in the first instance, about speaking or even doing. It's, first of all, about receiving. One cannot give what one does not have. An evangelizer must first of all be evangelized. We need to first receive with faith and joy the truth about Jesus. We must know him first. And then, like Mary, we can carry that intimate knowledge with faith and joy to others. Let's pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Teach us how to joyfully bring Jesus to others. Share with us your joy, O beautiful star of evangelization, so that we might be bearers of joy, who is Jesus, to others. Amen.